Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to talk here and congratulations for this uh, really amazing Congress. Um, I was invited to speak about the Accurate Program. Um, I have, first of all, to declare my conflicts of interest, uh, which are basically, in, in this case, uh, most important proctoring for Boston Scientific. Um, if you look back on the history of the Accurate Valve, it started in 2006 with the um, Cymatis company. It's still sometimes called Cymatis, uh, the valve. Uh, they developed a transapical valve, which is not available anymore in this design, that was first implanted in 2009, received CE mark in 2011, and in parallel, the transfemoral system that we know in our days uh, was developed. It was first implanted in 2012, received CE mark in 2014, and the same valve was adopted to a new uh, transapical delivery system, uh, first in men 2014, and is available um, with CE mark since 2017. 2017, the company was uh, bought by Boston Scientific, and since it's called Boston Accurate, the valve. In the meantime, about 25,000 of those valves have been implanted, and this is the current iteration of the design of the valve. It's a very supra-annular design. Um, the most uh, impressive feature when you look in fluoroscopy on the valve are those three stabilization arches on top of the design. They are not meant for anchoring the valve. Normally only one of them or none of them touches uh, the aorta when the valve is finally deployed. But the job of those stabilization arches is to allow the valve during the deployment process to align in the native anatomy to avoid flaring. Below those stabilization arches you can find um, the so-called commissural posts where the valve is attached. They, they are free in their movement. So when you take a close look after the implantation on the valve, you can see that the valve is flexible in this part. This design is uh, not by chance, but out of the history of conventional biological bioprosthesis, where we know very well that this reduction of shear stress is an important factor of uh, durability of the valve. So this might play a role, but however, we don't know this data so far. Further below, you can see the upper crown, which is a structure which is meant to push away the native leaflets. And below, there is the stand that um, allows the anchoring and sealing of the valve. The lowest part, the lower crown called um, diameter, is three millimeters more than the nominal diameter at the waist of this diabolo-shaped uh, stand design, uh, which is given the size of the valve. Currently, there are three available. They're called small, middle, and large, and you can treat patients by IFU from 21 to 27 millimeters. In all day practice, it's normally no problem to treat smaller patients. You will not, not end up in higher gradients, even if you have a uh, somehow strange formed lower part of the stent, because the valve definitely is ways for, um, uh, higher located. But I would definitely not recommend to treat patients which are larger than 27 millimeters. And this, of course, is a limitation of this uh, current available sizes. You saw already the, the transfemoral delivery system here presented in the, in the Live in a Box case. Basically, it's important to understand that it's a two-step deployment. You find here those two rotation knobs. Um, the first rotation of knob number one unsheathes the upper part of the valve, as uh, uh, illustrated here, by retracting this sheath here in the handle. And the second step unsheathes the lower part, um, which is going uh, to the ventricle. In between those two steps, there's a safety button, which is meant just to prevent uh, that someone is turning uh, step two in advance. The system can be introduced uh, through the relatively new 14 French ice leaf expandable introducer. It's a bit similar to the Ishis that uh, most will know, I think. Uh, the major difference is that you have three uh, fracture lines, I would say. In case of this valve, you don't fracture the sheath, but it just unfolds and refolds also. So I pretty like the, the system. Um, you can also implant the valve through an Ishis work too. And you can also implant um, the Sapien valve through this sheath, which uh, helped me in a couple of cases. TA system is also available, as I told you. It's the same valve that is crimped on this system here, of course. Situation is easier because you have enough space, because you pull the sheath out of the ventricle. So the deployment is only one step. Basically, you rotate this knob um, and unsheath in this direction. You can resheath in this design too. 
And the safety button here is just the point of no return when uh, uncheezing the valve. Here's a small animation of how the valve is implanted. Here, transfemorally, basically you push forward the valve. This is not realistic. It is norm normally in the outer curve where it stabilizes. Knob one is rotated. You uncheeze the upper part of the valve. Valve is already working at this stage. There's no need for rapid overpacing. Normally you don't see any hemodynamic compromutation at all. And then safety button is released and step two uncheezes the lower part of the stent. That's it. So important three-step procedure and as Gregory just told you during the life in the box case, the crucial part is to find the initial positioning and then you somehow fire and forget the valve. So it's for people who start with this valve, most are known to core valve and, and sapien, it's way more similar to implanting a sapien than a core valve. That's important to know. So I would not recommend to play a lot with the wire to achieve any, any other alignment or so, but just go straight forward. Here you can see um, another example of a valve implantation. I didn't want to bore you as you saw the live case already. So this is the next generation. You see the most prominent difference is here a marker point, which makes it indeed easier to find your correct height. Step one is opened, final root shot to confirm the correct height. Pigtail is removed and the valve finally implanted. I switched to this uh, technique to, to implant straight forward one single uh, scene and implant the whole valve. So basically what you saw here is the whole implantation process. So pretty straightforward. Here you can see an example of a more complex anatomy. It's definitely a horizontal aorta where we could think that flaring might play a role, um, but you can clearly see that the opening of the upper part first allows the alignment and when the valve is implanted, it just pops up exactly as predicted. So I think horizontal aorta is even easier in this kind of valve design because the stabilization in the outer curve is always easy. So that's definitely one of the, the good indications for this design. Another good indication is very poor ejection fraction patients. We combine here the true flow um, balloon of Loma Vista. We heard it in a previous talk um, that allows uh, pre-dilatation without any rapid overpacing and afterwards you can implant the valve without rapid overpacing. Some colleagues already went so far that they don't even have a pacer in the hybrid room. However, I don't feel, feel comfortable with this strategy. Some clinical data, I don't want to bore you, but just um, um, show you the, the three most important studies. The first is a post-market registry, 1,000 patients, uh, and then two, um, two uh, propensity-matched uh, competitive uh, uh, studies. So SAVI-TF, the first 1,000, it was almost an all-comer population of all the sold valves, which is uh, extraordinary. Uh, enrollment was mostly in 2014 already, a, a few patients in 2015 also. 30-day and one-year data is published so far. It's a typical TAVI cohort, uh, logistic euro score one of 18%, which was typical in those times, 80-year-old patients. 30-day um, results, and again, it was 2014, with a mortality of only 1.4%, what was extraordinary in those uh, days. Also, very good data on stroke and um, gradients, and also the lowest uh, so far published uh, new pacemaker rate in those days. One issue is PVL. So it was 4% of patients with more than mild PVL in this study. Next uh, slides I want to share with you is um, this um, multicentric uh, uh, one to two propensity matched uh, analysis with all comers in those three German centers of um, Sapien versus um, Accurate. Could see no real differences. Um, this is before matching even. Um, and relevant findings were less pacemakers in the, in the NEO, significantly less pacemakers, 36% less, uh, less elevated gradients over 20 millimeters and less uh, mean gradients in the whole cohort, but a higher rate on PVL, which is definitely the clinical experience in this valve. Less gradients, less pacemakers, but um, less ceiling. Next uh, interesting study performed in Cologne was also a propensity matched retrospectively collected data in, in five centers in Germany um, where they focused only on small anatomy, which is of course 
uh, interesting regarding gradients especially. So here the, the matched uh, baseline population with an annulus of 21.3 in average. Um, and basically the findings in this uh, examination were the same, so they had significant less um, patients. I miss uh, the slide, unfortunately. Significant less patients with a, a prosthesis patient mismatch and also when, when considering the talk yesterday about uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, in this study also clear symptom symptomatic uh, association to patient prosthesis mismatch. Some of studies are ongoing. This slide is somehow already outdated because the CE mark study um, first data was published last year already in, in London valves. We expect to get the CE mark this year for this particular valve for Europe. Two more studies, scope one is already um, completely enrolled. It's, uh, and that is what I think what we are really missing is prospective matched multicentric studies um, and um, are not matched, randomized trials uh, where different valves are compared. And this is scope one and scope two, where the accurate design is uh, randomized against Sapien and Evolute. Will be very interesting, I think, the results. And another study which is um, going to enroll mid of this year is um, the US approval study, IDE trial, where the next generation, NEO2, is already used. Will be very interesting the results, especially as they allow only three proctored cases per implanter. So that's uh, the most important study which will come in near future. So we talked already about the NEO2. We will get this valve within this year, and there are two improvements of the unchanged stand of the classical NEO. Um, and the first one is that there's an extra skirt on the outer side. Unfortunately, the, the company doesn't want uh, to share the, the pulse replicator pictures, which are really impressive, because the idea of this extra skirt is that it's flexible and works like an extra valve sealing the, the paravalvular region. And at least in, in in vitro simulation, it shows significant reduction of uh, PBL and also the very limited data of those 120 enrolled patients in the CE trial are very promising regarding a reduction, a significant reduction of AS, uh, of AR. The other thing I already showed you is this position marker, which will will help to ease uh, the the procedure. Two more slides. The first is more sizes are coming, larger and smaller, um, to be able to pr to uh, treat more patients. Um, and the very future plans for the valve are to allow commission aligned implantations, as it's already feasible for the TA system and a Rishi's ability. However, this will be sold. I have no idea. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, 